kind of, you have a kind of a long and impressive uh, bio, so that will probably take uh, take take some time. <laughs> Anyways, I saw I looked. It was like over three hundred articles. I'm thinking, ah, uh, okay, <laughs> you've done a lot of work in this time, uh, and and you moved to Israel, and you had how many five kids? Uh, oh, and, uh, yeah, that's over. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's five kids, uh, and Linda, of course, she's, a, you know, most, most of the credit goes to Linda, right? I did nothing. I just went to work. When I used to go to work in Toronto, I go to work here. It's the same, all the same. Linda, my wife is responsible for, you know, the success of Aliyah, uh, and our five kids also. They're married, um, and each, they all have families and they all live in the Haifa area. Tova's lives, Tova and her family lives the furthest away and the Carmel. All the rest live in the Krayot. Wow, that's really, really close. So they, they must like you guys. You can ask. Yeah, we do. We like them and uh, we, we maybe even a little bit, you know, too much sometimes. But... Uh, Toba also likes her in-laws, so that's okay. Yes, I... They live in the Carmel, so that's good. Wow, wow. So um, I, I, eventually I want to ask, what did you do right with... Like, what is it in your, the trajectory of your, like, you're a geneticist as well as, a, as well as a nephrologist, as well as a kidney uh, specialist. Uh, and you're a pediatric uh, um, geneticist. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've heard people speak about uh, DNA as um, the book of life, you know, that uh, some, uh, Elvis Costello says, we write in it every day. And I guess he, uh, preempted uh, epigenetics to say that, yeah, we actually do. Like when I was in high school, we learned that, uh, you know, once in a hundred thousand years, a uh, cosmic ray comes and it's our DNA right on and we get a mutation. And now we understand that it's an actual uh, living, evolving thing in, in real time. Um, so, Very much so. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. Another person you should speak to about Aliyah, but this is going way back. You may have already... Well, probably one of it, Israel's one of Israel's most distinguished scientists who made Aliyah for New York is Chaim Cedar at, at the Hebrew University. He is the um, father, uh, or co-father with the late with the late Aaron Razin, an Israeli. Uh, it's another good story of an American a Ole a graduate of MIT, uh, MD from NYU. You know, pairing up, he discovered epigenetics. He and Aaron Razin, and he once gave a talk. Uh, showing that exercise, exercise can change, polish the DNA. It's called methylation. He discovered methylation, polish the DNA in in a healthy way. Okay, and it all it require. And then he showed in mice that just one session of exercise could permanently change the methylation of key areas of DNA that render the mouse more healthy. So a a person who's overweight in the audience put up his hand at the end and said, oh, does this mean I can go to the gym once and that's it? So uh, Chaim tells this story. You should, he's, Chaim is the father of Yossi Sidar, the, the famous Israeli producer and director and, and, and so forth. So, oh, I see our son, yes, he's also joining us by, um, even though he's somewhere at Rambam, I guess. Hi, ah, Yossi, if you're there. Um, so, uh, just a, here's Yossi. Right. Hi. Hi. Anyway, so, yes, Neil. So this is Neil uh, and Yossi. It's also at Rambam. I see you in your office. And Tova and I are here in my office. Okay. Are you a geneticist also? Yossi, are you also a geneticist? Oh, oh uh, no. I'm, uh, I'm a rabbi. Okay. Well, that, that's kind of um, the, the, the question I had. I mean, is that, you know, it's talking about the the uh, trajectory. You know that like we're like writing the book of life. Everybody's supposed supposed to write their own Torah, their own uh, you know their own Bible. And in a sense, by what we expose ourselves to, and you just said by um, the exercise we do or don't do, uh, we're writing and polishing our own story in an ongoing way. And I think it is as a rabbi, you you would uh, you would say probably that um, this is not you know, just our story. It's the story of our whole people. And it's like, a, you know, I mean, I don't want to start with the rocks. I've, I've lately been listening to a podcast about origin of life. 
And uh, the latest thing seems to be, you know, that even like the, the crossover, the finding line between inanimate and animate uh, is sort of blurred. Um, and, and, I, and anyway, I don't want to get too involved, but I'll, I'll just get, tell you that little um, thing for a moment. Um, you know, so I say, wait a second, does that mean, you know, if rocks are alive, like they can do, make polymers of themselves and they can compete for electrons and stuff like that. Uh, and then like rocks are alive. So I thought, wait a second, like we refer to uh, Hashem, to our God as a rock. Um, Har Sinai is a bunch of rocks. You know, the Mount Sinai is a bunch of rocks. The, 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 um, Stones by Jacob's head competed with each other. And, right. There's several places where rocks as witnesses. And then I thought, uh, I, I'm also a fan of uh, a mycophilia of uh, mushroom growers. And this fellow, uh, Paul Stamets, not, not a Jew, uh, he, as far as he knows, although I'd be interested to hear the genetics of a lot of the non Jews who probably are somewhere Jews. And he said, you know, that, uh, you know, like plants and mushrooms in particular, since they're closest. They have, they're closer to mammals than plants are, um, you know, that there are, there are ancestors and they have a lot to teach us. So this thing about rocks coming everywhere in our religion is, uh, is strange and remarkable. And uh, it, it makes me think like we're sort of like, are we, you know, I know rocks don't have DNA as far as we know yet, um, but, you know, like, but definitely our Book of Life, our DNA is, uh, is a, uh, whether it's from rocks or whatever, you want to start the DNA. Um, I don't know when DNA first came into the origin, origin of life um, is, a, is a, you know, it's a discipline. There was just a big international meeting um, less than a year ago put together by Professor Tony Futterman from the Weizmann Institute, who is a and Doron Lancet, who you may have heard of, is a geneticist and origin of life uh, researcher. Uh, so Israel has quite a bit of uh, research in origin of life. I happen to be that meeting, not because I study origin of life, because it also had a component called, you know, population genetics. Um, but uh, there are many, of course, as you've read, if you're inter interested, there are lipid theories, RNA theories, clay theories, rock theories, all kinds of theories about how or how life and what is life and what is alive, what isn't alive and how it becomes alive, it's it. So, um, but the, but definitely you're right that clay, rocks, et cetera, may, there, there is a whole discipline related to their role in, in, uh, in life. Uh, yeah. But it's dynamic, you're right. So what you learned about a cosmic ray hitting a piece of DNA and then causing one change and then waiting another hundred thousand years for something else to happen is probably not what's going on. Uh, genes jump from place to place. Tova is much more knowledgeable uh, and they're, they change their expression and they, they, uh, they're very dynamically regulated um, and in, in the body and in the germline. Yeah. So it's right. It makes it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And is, is that, um, yeah, I know I'm also a, 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 was a fan of uh, Fritzweil and he's, he's, he talks about methyl, methyl is methyl, methylation. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's, uh, he's a, maybe on the obsessive side. I think he takes like hundreds of supplements every day and gets yeah. his blood gets fused every couple of weeks. Um, but yeah. more to the point um, about like you guys making Aliyah yeah. and that's a, that's a trajectory. Yeah. That's a, uh, you know, uh, the word in Hebrew for exercise, uh, imun, is, uh, is cognate with the word uh, for, for faith, for belief, you know, emunah, imun. Not of that, you're right, yeah. Emunah, yeah, imun. So uh, you guys exercise your options, so to speak, um, to, uh, to make aliyah. And, uh, and that's you know, in itself a remarkable thing. You know, I'm sure, you know, you could have... Um, uh, to say it straight, you could have earned, uh, or all and your kids could earn, you know, multiples of of which, which you know, your salaries are here, and um, and I think a lot of the medical students who train here. That's one thing I brought up in our last short conversation. Yeah. I think a lot of the medical students who train here, um, you know, at the kind of at the 
on the on the at the ben at the expense of the government to a great extent do head out and um, they don't have to pay it back. Uh, so anyway, I don't want to get distracted about that. Although I'd like to take that subject up at another time. Um, so the question is, um, you know, what was it about where you came from, your parents, uh, and uh, Carl, and um, you know, I can see in the amount of influence, positive influence uh, that you've had on your own kids. Uh, just keeping them close by is remarkable, and keeping them. Um, it, it apparently uh, engaged uh, in uh, in significant and um, and interesting um, fields, you know. So something happened, you know. Uh, you know when did that? Do you know when that began? Like this kind of, well, you know, you you have a certain momentum. Um, you know, it should, it should continue for uh, many generations. But do you know when that momentum began? I mean, have a sense of that. Um, I can speak for myself, Neil. I think, you know, every one of, you know, I, I didn't go to the spouses of our kids. They also have interesting stories, but I figured, you know, the family that made Aliyah, made Aliyah as, uh, you know, adolescents, it's also not that common for a couple to move five kids at a very vulnerable kind of age. And adolescence is often considered, uh, a more challenging time. So the kids were nine to 19, right? Yossi's the oldest, he was 19 when we made Aliyah, right? 18 and a half. 18, 18 and a half, okay. And Esti was eight and a half. So, you know, most of them, all but Esti, were already in the teen years. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, you know, some people say, I don't know, Tova's a pediatrician and geneticist. Yossi has teenage kids, so he could say, Adolescence is often considered a self-limited disease, right? So adolescence, you know, it's something you, have to, you go through and then you come out of it. About 1% of people stay adolescents for the rest of their life, but most people, you know, just remit spontaneously as long as they don't do any harm. Uh, so making Aliyah during adolescence. So I, I say the great credit goes to um, Linda and our kids because they are the ones who had to um, undergo this very... Uh, quite dramatic uh, transition. The transition for me personally was much less dramatic because I spent, as I said, you know, it doesn't really matter the uh, department, uh, clinical department, pipettes, mice, uh, cells and culture are not that different in Canada and in um, Israel. So I didn't really uh, undergo that much of a change other than maybe, you know, um, in terms of financially and things like that and a few, a few cultural aspects. The, the kids though and Linda did. Um, but let's go back to Canada. I would say the momentum began in Canada. Uh, and first of all, I want to say clearly that Canada, Toronto, our community in Toronto, uh, again, and I think you could speak to each, each person separately if you have the time. Eventually, you can you know, book a time, and I'm sure each one, everyone can give their own perspective, and everyone has a slightly different perspective or even a very different perspective. But um, first of all, I want to say that Canada, the Jewish community we lived in. I grew up in the Shepherd Bathurst area. Our family were in uh, both in Thornhill and in the Prue Avenue area. Uh, you know, it was a strong, um, very strong, cohesive, um, supportive Jewish community that is not, and we did well and we, we were, I think, in, in good shape as, as Canadian Jews. Um, uh, Etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, that being said, and you spoke about, let's say, go back to Linda's parents and my parents, you know, uh, we, we also grew up in a, in a religious Zionist. My parents were not, okay, I'll, and, and Linda's parents were not necessarily religious Zionists, but I grew up and I studied in, uh, you know, Associated in Chad. Uh, our kids studied in various schools in Toronto, whether they be in Etivod, uh, the Opana or Chaim, in the case of USC, uh, or one of our daughters in Beis Yaakov, which is not particularly Zionist, but, but, but um, still, um, you know, Jewish values uh, and the importance of mitzvot in Eretz Israel and a mitzvah living in Eretz Israel and the fact that mitzvot really can only be properly fulfilled in Eretz Israel and the mitzvah. In other words, I would say, for me anyway, the main motivation was, you know, there are certainly... Uh, about whether it's 
mandatory to live in Eretz Yisrael for a Jew. So, you know, there are differences of opinion. There's all kinds of things you can read about it. And I, and far be it from me, maybe Yossi as a rabbi can uh, say more about it. Uh, but no rabbi would deny that, that it isn't a strong, important mitzvah. No one might, you might say you can, a Jew can be a Jew outside of Israel, possibly. And, and certainly there are circumstances where, where it's impossible to make aliyah for certain reasons. But if one can make aliyah, if it's possible, then it's certainly a huge, huge, huge mitzvah. And I would say that was the, for me personally, that was the main motivation. If I felt personally incomplete as a Jew, uh, as as good as things were, and as much as we were going to shoot and going to Inyanim and doing everything, I felt, you know, again, this is a harsh thing to say, hypocrisy, a, a, an element of hypocrisy. Like, you know, I'm putting on fill-in in Toronto or Boston or somewhere. What am I really doing, uh, et cetera? The other is historical. My, my you know, parents are uh, Holocaust survivors. Um, and, um, you know, my... Father was liberated from Mutthausen. He lost a prior family. Uh, my mother was much younger, and she was in Auschwitz and liberated after a death march from uh, uh, Ravensbrück after the death march from etc. They went through the worst hell of of uh, the Holocaust that can be imagined. You know, if you read Primo Levi and this, you know, everything. It's all. It's all. They they went through the worst hell, and and then you know, set up a family. I was an only child in, in Toronto. And basically I grew up with this. I grew up very much in, in under about the world potential for, um, you know, where we're as good as things are in many places. I, I always had this feeling that we're a guest. We're not really a guest in Canada, we're, we're very welcome guests, very, very well-treated guests, extremely embraced, contributing a tr tremendous amount, but we're not really at home. We're in a wonderful hotel, in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to be in a home which may be less uh, luxurious, but it's completely ours. And if there's fighting and, and if, et cetera, and if there's difficulty, there's challenges, we're it, we're making decisions, uh, the contentious decisions, but they're decisions. Um, and uh, I think, so there's the historic, there's a religious, primarily the social historical imperative I felt always. And I began to feel it at age 15. My first trip to Israel ever was when I was 15. Uh, and I remember very coming back uh, from the first trip to Israel. I remember being at a bus stop. I remember this very vividly at Shepherd and ba on Bathurst, just south of Shepherd, waiting for a bus. And and I, this sounds horrible. I think the kids have heard it. I felt after being in Israel for a, the summer, part of the summer, I felt I was dead. I felt I'm not alive. I said, you know, I'm. I mean, I I don't. I didn't feel. I felt I'm, I have no meaning here. I'm I'm sitting at a bus stop waiting for a nice bus in a nice environment, everything like that. But everything's happening somewhere else. My my, uh, and I'm witnessing. I'm hearing about it. I'm I'm reading about it. I'm learning it in school, but I'm not part of it. I didn't want to be an observer. I want to be a participant. Um, this is before I met Linda. Uh, I met Linda uh, just a few years later. My wife, my wife, and her background. Also, her family. Our family was from Krakow area. Her family's from uh, Hungary. Uh, also, uh, when so like a mixed marriage, according to my, I'm in the same I'm in the same boat. Okay. Still, scandal, yeah. yeah, Hungary, Poland, yeah. So, so, um, you know, same kind of uh, experiences in the past. Uh, although, my parents and Linda's parents, you know, had no intention of making aliyah whatsoever. They did eventually after we did. They did. They followed us. Um, but they did give us the educational background, uh, and Linda and I met at a, a Hebrew speaking summer camp, Camp Massad in Northern Ontario. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we've been together for, for more than for 51 years. And it was clear to both of us that we would one day make Aliyah. Uh, I won't go through, you know, we were in Boston, we did a lot. We actually, in 1981, when uh, it was, we stayed 
left Boston in 1984, 81, 82, I looked, I met the Shalia Chalia. Kids were, kids were a little then. Uh, not all of them were born yet, uh, in Boston. And the Shalia Chalia, maybe this shouldn't be put on the record, um, oh, told, told us, um, yeah. well, don't make Aliyah yet. Wait. Which I think, maybe he was right, but the Sochnura or whatever, the, I'm not sure that's the right answer for Shalia Chalia. He may have been right. Um, I actually, we did a tour, Linda and I did a tour, looked at the possibility of making Aliyah in the early 80s. And then went back to Toronto instead from Boston. This is as we were finishing my training in Boston, went back to Toronto. A, a, a very important time period was when we made, did a Shabbaton in 91. Um, we, uh, we all landed Shabbaton at the Weizmann Institute from the University of Toronto. Uh, I was just appointed head of nephrology at the University of Toronto. And I took a Shabbaton just before starting that. Um, at the Weizmann Institute, where I kind of relearned some of the move more from physiology to genetics. And the, we landed uh, uh, on January 10th, 1991. And the first, in the Gulf War, you know, the Saddam Hussein missile started falling on, I believe, Friday night, January 14th or 15th, I think. So, uh, pardon? Nomi's birthday, January 15th. So, so well, and cake on the cake mix on the plane to celebrate. Yeah. So, so we spent the Gulf War in, you know, in the heart of where the Scott, no one knew what were on these Scots, you know, and we, 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 it, it had a big effect on us because we felt we were part of the history, a, a difficult history, a challenging history, a, a somewhat frightening history. But, you know, we said, hey, we're, we're now part of it. We're not reading about it at the, in the Toronto newspapers. We're actually here. Um, experiencing it. Experiencing it and living through it. Now, many people thought we were, and still think we're very irresponsible parents. You know, they, they would say to us, you know, what are you doing? Um, you're taking your kids in harm's way. Um, yeah. And that's, that's an issue. And it's an issue even today. Um, when, when kids go to share with me, the army and stuff, right? You mentioned maybe yeah. that your parents came as well. Yes. And I would say that a very, you know, into the, in, you know, of course, interestingly, my parents did not just try to dissuade us. They did not even try. They knew we were too stubborn or single-minded. They did not say, come back, leave, return is too dangerous. Rather, my, my parents, who were not that young at the time, in their 70s, um, decided that they would just join us. They, they got on a plane, and, they in, and when they landed at Ben Gurion Airport, um, a, that's when Scud missiles fell at Ben Airport. And well, we ran in, you know, I ran in. They wanted to put a gas mask on my father's, on my father. He was already older. He'd already lived through, you know, the, the, the wars, he said, no one's putting a gas mask on me. I'm sorry. You know, that's, you know, so, and, and they left him alone. I told the, the, um, the, the, uh, Aftaha person at, uh, Ben Gurion, you know, please leave my father alone. You're, it's, it's, you're not, you're not helping him by putting a gas mask on him. He's take, he'll rather take the risk than he's, it's, he's already been through worse. So, um, that whole stay in Israel. I think consolidated a family, um, certainly Linda and myself, and the kids. I would say those each one will speak for themselves. Each, there was wasn't a uniform high level of enthusiasm, but everyone was agreeable, of course. Uh, yes, he was in a transition year anyway to do you know a yeshiva in Israel. Everyone was a, a bit different, but I think everyone was on board. And I have to say, it's a blessing. It's not lomuvan may love. It's not to be taken for granted that, you know, teenage kids who, you know, are rebellious by, are supposed to be rebellious. It's part of growing up. If you're a, a teenage kid who isn't rebellious, you know, has some yeah. level of rebellious. Yeah. Well, but knock off on when skiing once is her big, big act. Everyone has a little act of rebellion as a kid, but they did, they, they moved to Israel and they adjusted, which is amazing to me. And I view it as a blessing. And certainly I had nothing to do with that. Uh, it's all them and Linda. I, I just stayed out of the way. Uh, that 
if you maybe it's momentum, that's the momentum. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say that maybe the most, uh, of all the smart things you've said so far, that may be the smartest thing. Um, I learned that uh, kind of late on. And my wife's also from Toronto, also from uh, Child of Survivors. And I'm also the product of a mixed marriage, uh, Hungarian and Polish. Uh, but I only learned late on that, um, and I just was blind to it, that, you know, most of the arguments I, I uh, conducted, I, I consider that I conducted them uh, with my wife, were about child rearing. Also, as, as, a, um, as a pediatrician. Uh, and I realized, like, I'd never won a single argument. And that was like completely, you know, the, you know, completely a waste of energy and created so much bad faith. So anyway, it's just to say that you, the husband staying out of the way is a uh, smart thing. The other, I just want to make some comments before uh, they have too many comments to make. Uh, and that is that that's kind of um, uh, conventional wisdom. Uh, don't bring your kids after the age of eight or 10 or 11 uh, because um, it's too difficult. Um, but uh, then the whole thing of difficulty of raising your kids with a sense of uh, being able to confront or even welcoming difficulty. You know, the whole, uh, uh, this guy Huberman uh, talks about uh, podcast. Uh, anyways, uh, he talks about uh, do dopaminizing difficulty, like welcoming difficulty and, uh, and feeling inspired and challenged and engaged by it. So uh, I think that's that's part of it. On the other hand, uh, uh, is the whole thing of the place of camps, of um, and I mean summer camps, yes, uh, and uh, also Shabbaton. Um, it's uh, I've seen uh, you know again and again that um, people who were even who were not raised in religious or even traditional homes went to Jewish summer camps, especially in Canada. It comes like more than you know, family of families uh, is led to uh, was a crucial experience in the sense of engagement uh, in in Jewish life, and uh, and then also uh, I mean I've been seeing that from time to time. Um, this is a little bit strange, but um, if you think of people who accomplished remark remarkable things, like you know uh, Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos. None of them had, and, Mo, and Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, um, none of them had, were raised with, uh, with birth fathers. Uh, not to mention uh, Yishkin, you know, who's like, that's kind of his tradition is, right. my father was, father, right. yeah. I, I believe father. Uh, so um, that whole sense of like the father is maybe somewhat absent or somewhat, uh, you know, holding back a bit or busy with something else, busy with the making a living. And, and so the, I think the kid has to create his own, in a sense, to be his own, become his own father. And also the whole thing of difficulty. I know, um, who's the guy in England that started uh, Virgin Airways? Um, the story is that he was subjected to, at the age of five, his mother's like put him outside of the, of the car and said, you're walking home. Uh, and, and, you know, some kids would say, uh, you know, that's abuse and that's uh, whatever, traumatic. But apparently for him, also uh, another, uh, you know, situation of, you know, the mother being the, the dominant uh, thing, person in the family and also difficulty. So those are kind of, uh, I think, maybe twin themes. And then the other thing that you brought up, which is, uh, is, is very significant, is um, the synchronicity, the co you know, co coincidence, the, the the timing happening together of personal and historic uh, life, you know. So, I want the, for me also, I, I had a I came, I visited when I was also fifteen, and and uh, we were at the hotel, and my father said uh, that his father uh, would have given his right arm to have been there, and uh, and that sense of Oh, this is something that's happening in real time, and either I'm in it or out of it. So um, that's if you if you notice my um, it's like what are you what are people waiting for? You know, um, 
Anyways, anyway, this isn't about me. I, you know, yeah, I, yeah. Neil, I, I, yeah, but the points you, you raise trigger a couple of issues I kind of think might be important. Uh, one is the process of making Aliyah. I noticed all along the way, I felt a little bit, again, La Havdin, I don't want to sound at all pretentious, like I was being tested uh, because there were many reasons that I we could have backed out. Um, and I won't had something to have to do with money, you know, something to do with Canadian taxes, something to have to do with uh the fact that I'm a Cohen and I can't really it's different if you're a Cohen and a physician in in, in Canada versus in Israel. Yeah. And uh, it turns, you know, so I remember wondering and what I, what answer I wanted. The faculty of medicine here in uh the Technion where I was you know, and also the one in Bar Ilan and Sfat, there are no cadavers in the building, right? Whereas others are. And I remember asking the dean who recruited me at the time, Paris Levy. He said, no, no, don't worry about it. We, Kohanim, you come into our building. We have no, you know, but these were all kind of things in the way that could have gotten in the way. Uh, and I remember as we were negotiating the Aliyah with, and I'll talk, I think I spoke to you about you know, the models for I, the one I, we followed, I'm not sure it's the absolutely recommended one, but um, I, 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 you know, being a believing person, I, during the process, I had a trip to Israel with Devora. our, after Yossi, the next oldest uh, of our kids is Devora. Uh, she's a teacher and um, worth speaking with. And um, she and I, did a, a father-daughter bonding trip to Israel uh, a few months before we moved. This was just, we moved in, well, actually, maybe 10, you know, I think in November, and we moved in August, so quite a few months before. And uh, it was during this time that, you know, there were many, re many reasons I could, we could have backed out, kind of, for, you know, the height of Oslo. And we could, we, Dvor and I went, we went to Jericho, we went to all kinds of places. And among other places, we went to Minharota Kotel, okay? And we stood in the location under the Minharota Kotel, which is said to be the closest to the Kodesh Kodeshim, where you stop, as you know, I'm sure you know this place, and you can stop for a few minutes and, and say a prayer where you're as close as possible to Kodesh Kodeshim without, you know, then people didn't, what, I don't know, people didn't go up on the, on the, on the, Temple Mount, uh, which of course uh, Toba's family does regularly, um, but uh, but I do not. Uh, anyway, so I remember stopping and say, "What am I going to pray for?" Okay, here I am in this important moment. Devora was with me, and I said, "You know what? I'm going to pray to Hashem that He give me the strength not to make aliyah, not to let any of these impediments." And there were many. Uh huh steer me off the course. And that was my prayer. That, yes. was, that was all, nothing else. And then moved on. Um, so, uh, because, you know, it's, it's not a simple thing. Yes. On the other hand, Neil, it's not as hard as everybody thinks it is. I, and I find, you know, it's, it's people are people. There's this whole ethos that, every, you know, everyone's taken advantage of. North Americans are exploited. Um, Israelis are exploitive. Uh, uh, et cetera, this, yeah, you can't, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, it's it's a little exaggerated and it's good to have these, you know, war stories if I survived Aliyah, right? But it's it's not as difficult. And as I think I spoke to you in a previous conversation, I think, you know, at least for us, I always, and I tell colleagues, especially in the medical field, you know, get an anchor. You don't have to have an anchor, which is equal near even a tenth of the income that you have as a you know a specialist in ophthalmologist in in um you know okay. in jersey but you have to have some anchor in a decent setting and then you can you can make a you can ha make a mikhobad living in many professions not just medicine but you do have to have that anchor and we everyone is a little different but i i have noticed i think and I don't know if there's statistics and research on this. Another part of our aliyah was, I think I mentioned this in previous conversation, 
failure is not an option. This is it. We have no, we, 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 I could have gone, we could have gone back to Canada. They would have taken, I have my license. It's a, you know, I could have gone back, but the mindset was we're not, I'm not going back to do a little bit of, you know, make a living in Canada part of the time or, or Boston. I, everything has to work in Israel. Uh, there is no part-time in our, in my view, no part of it. Many of my colleagues follow a different path. They keep a major position. I'm not saying this is wrong, but it would, wouldn't work for us. Keep a major position in uh, North America for mostly for revenue, and you know, live much of the year in Israel, but you know, spend quite a bit of time practicing their profession in North America. Uh, that also can work. But I would say in terms of, you talked about publications and impact. If you want to have an impact in Israel, my Israeli colleagues need to see me here all the time, totally invested, completely. And I think it's true of the kids too. I think, you know, they didn't want to see your friends and, and the kids' friends and then and marriage and et cetera. You know, you're in or you're not in. Uh, you're not half in. Um, and that's kind of how I think we conducted ourselves. We were all in. This is not, you know, once you make Aliyah, you make Aliyah, it's over. You're not, you know, there's no other, there's no other option. And therefore, you have to succeed uh, to the best, you know, with Kodesh Baruch Hu's help, of course. And that was the mindset. I don't know, maybe Tova thought of it differently. It never crossed my mind for even a millisecond that we were ever going back. Wow. Well, I didn't think that was uh, part of the plan for it. Yes. That's something. Yeah, that, that's what I preach. Um, like I say, we, we, once in a while, we have a customer who says, well, we want to store, because I'm in the Aliyah shipping business, like we ship yeah. people's stuff. Um, and, um, and they said, we'll want to store our stuff in New Jersey, uh, and then we'll take a year and we'll see if the kids like it. It's like, okay. It's like, uh, so I said, like, is that how you got married also? Like you, uh, you know, I'll keep a girlfriend on the side or a nice Hungarian girl, just in case, you know, uh, doesn't work out with the Polish person. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, and, and that's what I said. And, um, but my, I, myself, I remember, um, when I was in uh, basic training, uh, it was Schlav bent. It's meaning it was not like, uh, it was like a month long of, of really challenging stuff, like remarkably challenging stuff, even at the age of whatever I was, uh, 30 or something. And, um, and I remember thinking, listen, you know, don't worry, Neil, if this is too hard, you can just take a taxi to the airport and, you know, and go pack. So I myself, uh, and I, and the one, one of our local, uh, Canadian, uh, Rebutti, you know, also came uh, you know, in like 1980 or something. And he took a, he took a couple of years off, um, and, uh, and head back. Now I would also point out that things have changed, you know, and my, one of my senses of a marker, uh, is, um, even though we don't have cable TV, it's when they, they have cable TV here, you know, it's like, you know, if you want, you can surround yourself in a very, uh, um, I, and I even recommend this to people. I say uh, that like the crucial thing is creating or finding a, um, uh, a community of, of similar minded people. Um, and that provides a buffer. Everybody needs, uh, you know, we're, you know, on this planet with this very thin atmosphere. Everybody needs, you know, an atmosphere to, uh, uh, to breathe in and survive in. And, um, you know, there's no reason to expose yourself to, uh, you know, if, if, Driving freaks you out, you know, <laughs> you can get away without driving, probably even a better idea. And, uh, you know, having a community, uh, having a bubble, having, as you say, an anchor, uh, is, uh, is very important. Um, uh, and just one other comment that I want to, uh, make, um, you know, you said when you were 15 and, uh, on the corner of Bathurst and what the other street was, um, uh, that you felt dead. So. One of the, um, you know, I mean, a common definition in our uh, paradigm of death is 
where the soul is separate from the body, right? Um, like they say at you know, Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai a lot of the people, their, their souls left their bodies. And so it brings me around to the question of like, there's a, a sense in which uh, the land of Israel is a body. And especially when you go back to this thing of rocks and, you know, the wisdom of rocks and communicating that Moshe is supposed to talk to a rock. He's not supposed to hit it. It's like the humanity of rocks, the wisdom of rocks um, is the sense that when we're not in the body and the body is the land, uh, that's, a, that's a sort of that. Um, anyways, so that, that's sort of... Uh, you know, off the, off the subject of Aliyah, but also my sister had the same kind of thing. Uh, she went to the, one of my sisters went to the Aliyah Shalia in the Valley in California, in the LA. And the, and the guy said, what are you crazy? Like, you're going to leave the Valley and you're going to come. And she said, oh, okay. And she went home. So that's kind of the, the, the same similar model of uh, people who want to convert to Judaism. Although that's that's a whole other discussion. My my feeling is people should it should be easier these days. Um, is that um, uh, you, they're supposed to make it very difficult, you know, to uh, to to convert because it's 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 meant to be challenged. It's meant to be uh, you know our name is Israel. It's struggling with God. Our name is not you know. Uh, it's, right, there's also a model of uh, of being a servant of God, but. Our name is not a uh, servant of God. Our name is one who struggles with God. Israel means struggle with help with God. Um, I, I, I maybe, you know, since Tov is here, I mean, he can speak for a yeah. second. I, I can say that, you know, one thing, yes, he's off the line, but his class at Or Chaim, which is, you know, as, as you probably know, is a religious Zionist, uh, a school, uh, um, the counterpart of which is the Opana, which Tova went to. But Yossi's class, almost all are living in Israel now. It's one of the most successful Aliyah classes, I think, in the history of Toronto. I mean, so we have some kids from my chat class. But in Yossi's case, I think in a class of 20-something young men, uh, I think all but one or something live uh, and have their families in Israel, all but one or two. It's really, uh, it's remarkable. And it'd be just interesting to try to understand what happened. I can tell you in my case, Shlichim from Israel who taught yeah. me in chat were very influential, very influential. And that was when I saw Shaliyah who has been at Sanchan and who could learn Torah and who could do this and who that. It had a huge, you know, I said, wow. I mean, that's, the, and, and, participating in, in, you know, what is momentous Jewish history, uh, um, and rather than witnessing it and commenting on it from the side, you know, it was very important to me. Tova, your class also, there, there's some, um, sure. not quite like the There are a high percentage of people who, are, who made Aliyah and, and have their families. And you were, how, how old were you, Tova? I was... 15. Going to the 11th grade, 15, 16. 15, 16. And, but you quickly made friends. In other words, the, the, for, we, we did move into a totally Israeli neighborhood. Okay. Totally Israeli. We did not move right. to Ranana or, or, or Modin or something. Uh, but Tova, you more or less didn't continue that much of your friendships in Canada and made brand new a peer friends who found you to be interesting um, because you were, you know, you, 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 you did this crazy thing of moving from Pru Avenue in Toronto to, you know, some dinky place in Kirat Shmo, which no one ever heard of. Um, so you made friends quickly, right? People were interested. But basically, truly were, you know, they were Israeli, completely Hebrew speaking, barely any English speaking. But I went from Olpana Obot in, uh, in Toronto to Olpana Skula in Israel. So they, they dressed a little bit differently, but it was the same, a similar kind of mindset, a similar, you know, uh, yeah, religious girl school type of thing. It wasn't, 
in that sense of being, I mean, girls are girls everywhere, you know, teenage girls are teenage girls. So they weren't very different. Um, the fashion was different. I did speak, uh, I, I spoke Hebrew pretty well because I went to Hebrew day schools, but I speak Hebrew playing well enough, but they were similar. I didn't find that they were. But, so they, were, but they were nice to you, right? They, they were very nice to me. I didn't find them to be so different. Uh huh. Well, that, that's, that's an important point. And the, and how important would you say is the language? Is that, I mean, I, I also want to get back to, uh, you know, the thing about praying not to make Ali, and that's a really good thing. But I first want to ask you guys about, about language. Um, nowadays, I think, uh, you know, people have, people have much better English than they used to have, um, it come Israelis. Um, but, uh, would would that have been uh, a major that would have been i think a major hurdle um uh and uh my my uh my son um we we did the opposite kind of we the kids were born here and we raised the adult the latest last two kids um and we sent them to english speaking um preschool and so when my son arrived at uh at whatever it is nursery school uh, he, he told everybody that he was, uh, he was, uh, he just made Aliyah from Canada and that's why he didn't have Hebrew. <laughs> he was embarrassed and said that he didn't speak Hebrew. And I mean, there are people, um, uh, there's a guy, Arnold, I can't think of his last name right now, who founded, uh, Lewis, um, uh, you know, and never spoke Hebrew, uh, over And there are other people who founded businesses and, uh, who stayed here. I mean, my first 30 years here, my Hebrew was, uh, uh, embarrassing. Uh, and, but, um, anyways, it's, but it's not a deal breaker, but I also want to get to this point. I mean, first I want to reemphasize the point that moving to a similar, whether or not the, the language was exactly in line or not, um, but, uh, moving to a similar headspace, uh, people who were of a similar ill, that was, that's about community and that's community is. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, significant, you know, they say exercise in community. I don't know which in the medical literature, which comes first these days, um, but they're pretty close. Um, and, um, but I want to get back to what you said, Carl, about praying not to make Aliyah, um, which is you're in, you're in a good tradition of, uh, Moshe also, you know, chosen people to someone else. Uh, I'm really not, I'm really not cut out for this. And the prophet's also saying, I'd really rather not do this. You know, this is not what I, you know, I'd like to have a easy life this uh, lifetime. And anyways, so what was that about? No, I was, I was saying, you know, I was, Oh, I, I, I knew that all the, uh, was the right thing to do. I, it's, it's, it's no, it's just, it was clear to me i had heard and i studied the various uh rabbinical um decisors about whether and, and her you know whether not making aliyah is is um uh, a huge transgression or is it just a positive mitzvah a very 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 high value uh and um so that's the religious part. That's the historical part and all the rest of it I mentioned to you. So the, the prayer I said there was not to let impediments block because I could see in my mind that I was almost waiting for an impediment to make it impossible for me to make Aliyah, such as, you know, here I line up a position uh, in, in the faculty of medicine and then I didn't know what I wanted the dean, parents the to tell me, oh yeah, the place is just full of Jewish cadavers. You can't even step in the building. And then I say, okay, what a relief. Now I don't, I, I want to make Aliyah, but I can't. Uh, or uh, something else. I had an issue. It wasn't, it's not, you know, I, again, I don't want to bore with the details, but my position in, in Toronto was such that we had a tax year, which ended January 31st. Um, in order to defer a year's tax till your retirement, right? And I, so then I did, I forgot about that. And then as we're making Aliyah and leaving, becoming non-residents of Canada, 
Revenue Canada sends me a bill for 11 months of tax owed, which was a huge amount of money, right? And I, I didn't have it. I did not have the money. Um, so I was, I, I spoke to the president of the Technion in person, a, a, an, ama an amazing person, Zef Tadmor. And he said, you know what? I said, I have this problem. I didn't anticipate it, you know? Um, and I didn't know what I was expecting him to, wanting him to say. Therefore, okay, stay in Canada. He didn't say that, right? Um, and he said, we will lend you the money. We will give you, we will lend you that entire amount of money. You pay your tax and you come. And, and then he forgave the loan. Wow. Um, so I want to say that this was when I was at the hotel at that place. I said, you know, get, please help me, Hashem, help me not fall prey to these many impediments to Aliyah that can come up and give me an excuse. That was the prayer, right? Because it would have been easy for one of these to say, you know, and often, often I hear people say, you know, I really want to make, I tried to make Aliyah, I did it. It's just something got in the way. And you know what? I don't judge. First of all, I don't judge. Although I feel, I must say, I feel kind of, you know, sounds crazy. I feel sorry for people who, who don't make Aliyah, who choose who don't make Aliyah. I, I, I kind of, you know, terrible to say, but I feel sorry for them. I feel like, you know, they will live, they will live their lives, full lives, made contributions, been in very senior positions, uh, Secretary of State, I don't know, all kinds of things, whatever. But in the end, they've missed what might be the most important mission and, and expectation of a Jew in, in, in this day and age when we have a state of Israel. Couldn't do it like your, like your wife's, um, you know, you couldn't do it. My grandfather couldn't do it. Um, he may have wanted to pray. He couldn't do it. You know, now we can do it. We can do it. It may not be easy, but we can do it. If we can do it, we should do it. That's how, you know. Uh, do I judge some of it? You know, I, many of my colleagues, I have a good friend in, um, who lived for many years in, in Dallas, Denver, you know, he, he, and he says to me, I'm, I should be, I should do what you've done. I should make Aliyah. He's a nephrologist too. I should make Aliyah. I just, and I have no good excuse. And I, and I'm, I'm on, I'm incomplete and I, I, and I feel terrible and I can live with myself, but I just can't do it. And you know what? And I say, you know what? Don't, don't have to confess to me. I'm not, you know, we're not Catholics. I'm not a, I'm not a priest. <laughs> I'm not a professor. You do your best. You can't, you can't, you know, you have to acquire a certain amount of strength, et cetera, et cetera. And it's fine. You're fine You're doing as opposed to making excuses um, and saying, uh, you know, I don't know, the political, I, I remember when we were already on our way, somebody saying, you know, I can't make Aliyah because there, I couldn't stand seeing cars on Shabbat uh, on the roads. You know, I, I said, okay, that's fine. I didn't argue with the guy. Uh, I'd rather be in Canada and see cars of Goya. Fine, fine, okay. Uh, you know, so I don't judge, but, um, there's no question that the either a historical, um, social, like a camp experience, like you said, uh, or or religious imperative, are very very important to push through the impediments pre Aliyah and after Aliyah and over the years. Language, uh, you know, again, if you come from a, you know, because because there's more English and because we English is the other language, we find that. When I speak with a, you know, North American accent, still a heavy, heavy, heavy North American accent, uh, Israelis answer me in English when I, I talk to them in Hebrew. You know, I speak yeah. to them in Hebrew and they, they say, oh, you know, uh, you know, we, I speak in, in the broken English. They start talking to me in English. Uh, and that happens a lot. Uh, but it's at work, you know, I just, I didn't go to Ulpan or anything. We landed on Thursday, August 24th, I think. And I started working on Sunday. And as a department head, and I didn't go to a point, I just did, I just used broken Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, and the people in the, and the people in the department kind of smirked and stuff. And I just pushed through it and, 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 and Beit Shemush instead of Sherutim and all these, all these things. And they thought it was cute. 
yeah. and they helped me. Okay, so so question. Um, you um, again, not to uh, swell your head or anything, as much as it just deserves. Um, but you accomplished. Uh, I mean, I, you have over three hundred published uh, books, articles, uh, chapters, um, and I think probably most of those were done here. Uh, here, you did the. You know, everybody. What everybody knows uh, about the uh, the Cohen gene, and you've done stuff in genetics and in uh, in um, uh, stem cell research and nephrology, and this goes on and on. So. I, my suspicion is um, that a lot of the people who study here, because to get into medical school here, you have to be, um, you know, a, you know, uh, not not only a star, but a, a, like like a star of stars. And I think you know, uh, hopefully, that situation is going to be remedied somewhat by opening up more medical schools. Like you're the dean of uh, new medical school in spot. And I understand all the three medical schools that were designed for foreigners to come and study are now being incorporated within the body of the, of the existing medical schools. So my question is, um, uh, I imagine that uh, it's not just money, uh, that uh, many doctors uh, uh, and other you know, PhDs head for the U.S. Uh, and it's not just to triple the salary or whatever whatever the multiple is these days, it's because they feel like um, the level of, um, for, their, for their fellowships and postdoctorates and whatever uh, might be superior. Maybe they're going to accomplish more. They'll become, you know, stars in, a, uh, in, a, in that big pool and they've done it. I mean, a lot of them are, you know, have remarkable positions, in medicine and in science and every other field. Um, so the question is, um, do they have to leave to get um, to do their uh, fellowships, and do they have to stay? I mean, why? You know, I, I kind of came up with a you know uh, carrot and a stick thing about you know when um, in the innovation authority when you get money when Way has got money uh, to um, to develop their program here, there's a penalty that they have to pay back like six times as much if they if they bring the intellectual property outside. And yeah, and I'm sort of feeling like maybe they should do that for you know medical students because they're getting a highly subsidized uh education at a top level and then they're heading off. I mean it's good for Israel's reputation. It's good for the state of science in the world. So and the questions are again, you know, do they have to make Aliyah to do their fellowships and doctorates and do they have to stay um so um there, there are a couple aspects a good very good question i would say and maybe i'm sure tova has some perspectives on it do you want to go first uh, or do i mean no so so um first of all you know you point out some of the accomplishments i've uh, been privileged to have and a lot of it has to do with the fact that it doesn't have to do with tons of money I've had good success in, get, in getting uh, resources to support research, um, fortunately, through maybe a, maybe there would have been more in Canada. I don't know. But, um, but the main asset in success in research and teaching is who you surround yourself with, right? Who's around you. Not, in other words, you have to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. And if you... If you, you know, always surround yourself with people that are less smart than you, then you will never be challenged. You never rise up. And, uh, you know, again, I don't want to be, there, there are many smart Canadians, right? But the, the uh, level of intellectual competitive uh, drive is very high. And, and I surrounded myself or I was surrounded by very, very smart and good people, uh, and who, who I had to keep up with all the time. Right. It was quite like that in Canada. I have to say, maybe Tova doesn't remember as well, but my lab in at sick kids and in the Toronto jail were nice people. 
they were good people. There were a case, there were some, there were some geniuses. Okay. But many of them were, you know, comfortable, relaxed, intelligent, etc. Here, virtually everyone is, you know, is hungry and, and passionate about success in what they're doing, whether it be the best teacher, getting promoted, getting this, you know, finding out, curious, whatever's driving them. And that, that is a more important formula, in my view, for uh, career accomplishment than, uh, uh, than just, you know, having uh, lots of resource, financial resources and, and being surrounded by people who, you know, want to drink beer more than they, other stuff. Um, so now, as far as brain drain and, and stuff like that, I think for Israelis, a period of time abroad uh, is expected, not uniform, but is expected. Most Israelis spend several years in a fellowship abroad um, and benefit from that. One, because it's expected. Two, because they, they are exposed to you know, different uh, perspectives. But the most important benefit is networking. In other words, those Israelis who've been, it's not that they're exposed to smarter people or, or, you know, you can get anything you want basically through like we're communicating now. Um, you, you know, I, I publish and have collaborators I've never met in person, but I am close to, right? Uh, so it's, it's, but once you've been at Hopkins for a few months, you're an Israeli and you've been at Hopkins for three or four years and you have personal friendships with the head of, um, you know, molecular biology there or something like that. Then later, that person sits on the editorial board or the promotions committee or the, you know, and then that helps. That does help. There are Israelis. I will point, if, if Tova allows me, I'll point out one, uh, Tova's husband, right? Who is the head of uh, a very accomplished molecular pathologist, uh, head of a department at Ichilo, uh, a professor at Tel Aviv University. He's an Israeli who's managed to succeed without having all that networking connection and being abroad, but he is well known internationally just by virtue of his own. But many Israelis need that time. Now, do some of them get stuck abroad? Some get stuck. They get and they get sucked in. And there's a phenomenon I see, and I'm dealing with somebody right now who went to Northwestern for, uh, in Chicago for a few years, and he keeps adding a year. He said, well, I need another year because you know, I'm, I'm publishing that, and I need another year. And, and then we, we laid down the law and said, that's it. Your position here is gone. You have until this day to come back. Otherwise... I don't know if we'll take you back. We're going to open it widely. Uh, and he's coming back, right? So you're right. You have to, because it's, it's easy to, you know, one year is not enough. Two years could be three. Once it gets past three, it becomes chronic. You become a chronic expat Israeli expatriate. That's for Israelis. For I'm North saying. Americans who have made Aliyah, and I have, you know, at the faculty at Bar Ilan in Israeli, there's a, there's someone, you know, who's from San Francisco, et cetera, et cetera. I remember sitting in his promotion committee uh, as the dean pre presenting him for, for tenure and promotion. And they said, well, he hasn't been on an overseas fellowship. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, of course, he was born and raised in San Francisco. He's, he's, he's a graduate of a university. That, why, why does he have to do that? And and it was crazy. Wow. Oh, he is at UCSF? Yeah. Because that's like, you know, yeah. that's top. It's in the top five of, of, of the world. Uh, so, so, you know, I said, what do you want him to go to Nebraska for a year in order to say that he was in Nebraska? Is that what's good? You know, um, I, and there are depart, there's certainly departments and faculties in Israel. Uh, in all areas, not just talking about medicine, um, which are world class. If you look at some of the departments, the Weizmann, uh, they are, and others, and Tel Aviv, and the Technion, and you know, they are. Uh, and I have to say, you know, obviously, I, uh, 
uh, artificial intelligence uh, and network science at Bar Ilan uh, are are ranked in the top five or eight in the world. So so would you want to go to something that's ranked thirty because it's in Florida, or 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 go laterally in Israel to and spend you know? So I I that's a constant question, and the brain drain. Uh, I don't know how strong it is now, uh, comparatively, it was very strong in the past and there's certainly have very accomplished Israeli expatriates who stay, get stuck in North America. Um, and some of them, because there is a shortage of positions in Israel to come back to, um, but, but now with the increase in medical student applicate, uh, acceptances, et cetera, and the, and the, and the broadening of the system, I think and also restrictions that are in place in Canada, the United States. It's, it's harder to get there. Immigration is much harder than it used to be. Uh, so I think we're going to be in better shape in, retain, in, re, in retaining and recruiting, I think. Okay. So yeah, a lot of what you said prob probably applies more to people who are at the level of doing, um, coming in, coming professors or doing research. Right. My question is, people who are not going to go into yeah. academia or re medical research or scientific research, you know, practitioners, yes. you know, because it's, I'm sure it's different here. I don't really know how it works in America. Everybody here, uh, um, you know, all the, the, the doctors I've spoken to here, and this is, maybe sounds unpleasant, but, um, uh, but they say, uh, unsentimentally, uh, and even doctors who are based in America, still based in America, they say that American medicine is really um, money-based. Um, it's really like I asked, uh, we went to a gastro the other month, and I said, like, I was, I, I read or heard that, uh, you know, like colonoscopies are not so fashionable in Japan and Northern Europe, where the level of medicine is mostly excellent. And I said, like, why? In the, he says it's money. They charge yeah. like thirty thousand dollars, uh, you know, a, a, a colonoscopy. So, so um, my question is, getting back to that, is it is does the same thing apply to practitioners? Uh, and now, then I'm going to ask the second question because I don't want to forget it. Um, the, the question is about uh, people who come. Like I know that when when somebody makes aliyah, they get like their next degree paid for, uh, whether it's a, whatever, a master's or a BA or, um, yeah. or a PhD. Does that also apply to medical school? I mean, medical school, in any case, is a fraction of the cost of medical school. You know, like, what, probably less than a tenth or something, a medical school in America. So question is, does that apply to a medical school? And the other question is, um, do you, you know, to make up for, or kind of compensate in a way for uh, closing down things and medical schools that were in English, is there some sort of thing that maybe that you'll maybe welcome more Olim into uh, the medical schools here, or is there a possibility below? That's great. Good questions. Uh, I won't, you know, as opposed to what it says in Perkei Avod, I won't go into the same order of the questions you asked. Okay, I'll start with the um, with the closing of the American programs. So let me just say a word about that. Not everyone agrees with me, but um, the um, uh, uh, Tova taught American medical students in, at the Technion, the Technion American Medical School well, teams, right? At Tel Aviv had the Sacker system and uh, Ben Gurion had the MSIH. They were closed because it was considered, well, the facts spoke for themselves. The graduates of those programs did not stay in Israel. Very few stayed in Israel. They went back and served the communities they came from or went to in North America. And it was, and even though they paid high tuition and brought money into the system, they did not add a uh, human resource, medical human resource into the system, practicing that human resource into the system. And, but did use teaching. So, uh, you know, Tova taught these students and they were probably positive. You still teaching them because there's still some left. Um, and, and they have a positive experience here, but they're, they don't implement that on Israelis. 
So because of the need to expand the pool of Israelis who are studying in Israel, um, those programs were uh, shut down. Now, as far as getting accepted, so now who's expanding? Well, there are plenty of Israelis born and raised in Israel who want to study medicine in Israel and don't get in and go to Europe. Uh, and then some stay, but many come back. But it's, but it's you know, so all the schools are expanding. Uh, the bar Ilan Faculty of Medicine just got a, uh, an approval to open a six-year program. And so it has a six-year program, a four-year program, a three-year program with funding for it. So, um, and all the schools, so there'll be, more uh, enrollees and more graduates and uh, uh, many more. Uh, they're expanding uh, greatly. Does Israel have the capacity to teach all those students? The answer is, I think, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, will, will Olim, so this comes up a lot. We have, um, especially from France, uh, a few times we had a, people coming from France saying, how come I can't get in? I studied, I went to, I got a baccalaureate here, I'm this and that. The, the Israeli system isn't well-tuned to understanding what, uh, can I give an example from, so, Tova got a very high, she, got, she went to, you know, she got accepted to Tel Aviv University Medical School and started there, then she transferred to Technion because from, from, where, all right, which, which, where's school was first? Tel Aviv. Uh, Tel Aviv. Okay. Yeah, she went to Tel Aviv for the first few years. Then she met her husband who was studying the Tasnian or, or was in the army or something. I don't know. And she transferred the Tasnian. But she had, you know, she had a very high SAT score. But the Israeli acceptance system said, SAT, that's, we don't, we don't really respect the SAT. We're making you do a psychometric. Um, so she did the psychometric, but a high school in the psychometric, but the Israeli system didn't understand how to deal with North American, uh, credentials as, as, as much as, and they, and that's still a problem, uh, credentialing. Now, uh, the pre let's go to the physician, the practitioner in North America, the practitioner in North America wants to practice medicine in Israel, doesn't want to be a professor. Uh, at Tel Aviv University or Ben Gurion University, wants to practice medicine. Uh, is practicing medicine right now in New Jersey or you know in in um, Boca Raton, and wants to uh, and is an ear, nose, and throat specialist, and wants to practice medicine in Israel? Well, the credentialing part is not that difficult. It's much easier, by the way, than the reverse. An Israeli who wants to practice in Toronto or, you know, has a very hard time. They, 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 they don't really, they're, they're very gilded systems. Um, but, um, so it's not getting so hard to get credential. If you're, if you're from a North American school, uh, and have specialty certification and so forth, but you do have to have a used to, I, I think it's still the case. You do that. You, you have to have um, a tudat zehut, right? You can't, you can't, you know, be a visiting, you know, pretend, or you can come for two months for, I don't know, but you have to, uh, you have to, you know, fill out all the papers. And it's not that hard. Um, and then the point is what position you're going to get. And what I tell my colleagues, and I think I told you in the previous conversation is not to float around, not to say, I'm going to come, I'll do a little I'll work in this clinic a little, work in this clinic a little, but rather, and this is, I go back to the anchor, you become in the machoz, in a certain region, you're the consultant for ear, nose, and pediatric ear, nose, and throat, uh, practice in this and this area. The reimbursement is low. The reimbursement is low, but that's your anchor. And then you do well, you do well, you become known. Um, you're North American trained, Israelis kind of like that, and you're nice to the patients. And, and then you start, you know, building up the, the different coupons start asking you to come and join them. They want you because they want more, more of their patients and you can do very well, actually. Um, 
you, you don't make eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year or whatever they make in in you know a top notch you know some sort of specialist in, in New York who also pays pays rent you know pays you know basically you know they can't afford to send their kids to day schools there so I don't know what you know it doesn't it kind of washes out but Israeli specialists in practice who've built up their practice properly in the way I've mentioned who have an anchor, they know they're, they're listed in Maccabi as the, and their, their picture is there as the ear knows that specialist in, in, in the, uh, Sadera region or something like that, mm -hmm. then they will get clientele uh, and then they'll have another, you know, evening practice here and this and that all in the same region. They don't have to travel all around the country and they can do very well. They can do very well. And I, I, the trouble the hospitals have is keeping them because they do so well in their ambulatory practice. They they run away from the hospital two in the afternoon uh, to to make money. Um, and I don't know, Tova, your friends, most of your friends have have uh, mirpaot in the afternoon and evening. Yeah, and they they make they work hard, yeah. but they but their revenues are very high. Is that not true? Relatively speaking, compared to you know, you know, it's, it's high. Isn't I, think, it? I think so. I don't think they make as much as their North. I don't know. They don't make nearly as much as a North, North American equivalent, but they yeah. also, also, I must say, people are very angry sometimes at the regulatory nature of the HMOs in Israel, but they do prevent what you just described, you know, yeah. ordering yeah. MRIs to make money, ordering uh, procedures to make money. That happens much less in Israel. Caesarean section levels are low. There's less litigation, and caesarean section levels are lower. They're, they're not as they're not as low. Maybe they should be, but they're much lower than North America, where you have a lot of uh, medical legal protective medicine, uh, and you have a lot of fi finance driven medicine, a lot of it. And if you look at Israel's health indices, Israel spends seven point something percent of its GDP on on health, which is laughable but has health indices, which are like ninth in the world or 10th or something like that. Uh, Canada and the United States are, are, are you know, spend, you know, really? I don't know, 12% and have worse indices. So uh, I think one can practice good medicine uh, and, and one can make a living. It's, it's, a, it's that Olim, and I speak to the Nefesh Ben Nefesh colleagues about this, Nefesh Ben Nefesh, and I tell them, you know, I think you're giving, poor advice to potentially you're telling them to make their money in North America, join, you know, do they, I, I think, you know, they just have to set everything up here. That's right. I, I think that I think you're right about that. Cause as soon as you make money in America, first of all, if you go to medical school in America and graduate school and get a PhD in America, you start owing, you know, minus, minus $400,000 off the bat. That's one thing. And, uh, yeah. And also, you get addicted to, to all the dopamine, uh, you know, easy dopamine rushes, you know, uh, a nice car and a nice this and a nice that. Um, you know, I mean, you can, you can have great cars here too, of course, but I'm saying you get addicted to those certain uh, you know, like dopaminergic, uh, you know, things. Uh, um, but I, I have a couple of things. First of all, I might have mentioned about, you know, that if there's um, a greater... Uh, sense of integrity here because uh, it's not so muddy a uh, run. Only thing that I've bumped into uh, a couple, in a couple of places, including uh, my my son has a kidney chronic kidney thing, and they wanted to do uh, 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 a biopsy, and I looked it up and I said, like, are you gonna what are the, what are the chances uh, you're gonna change his treatment? Uh, depending on the results of his biopsy. And they said, Kimat FC, almost nothing. And I'm like, why would you want to do biopsy? And then I ran into a similar kind of thing like uh, yeah, somebody in the family had uh, some gastro issues. And and they, they went away as soon as they gave her a, a relaxant or something. And the doctors were insistent like, um, that she had to do, they wanted to do diagnostic surgery. Like, you know, and I was like, really, <laughs> you know, really? And, uh, and so I, I, and I asked, I confronted some or asked some American 
you know, docs about that. And they said, no, they didn't believe it. Like that couldn't happen here. And then it happened again. You know, I had a, a colonoscopy and there was, well, there's a red dot, and, you know, it, probably from taking aspirin at night or something. And we want to do, we want to take out your cecum and some of your ascending cult. I'm like, buddy, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't get too angry. Yeah, I, you know, med yeah. Medicine all over the world. Yeah. The, in, including in Canada and everywhere. I, you know, I, 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 people call me from all over the place for, for, for Brazil and Canada and this is for, for advice. Right. And what you're describing is part and parcel of variability in thoughtfulness and medical practice everywhere. I'm not sure it's that different here, there, or anywhere. I can tell you, at least my impression, worldwide, I think, but I see it very strongly in Israel because I see more going on here, is that evidence-based medicine, thoughtful medicine, uh, asking the same question, what difference is it going to make to the patient in the end, not how curious I am, uh, et cetera, is getting better and better and better, uh, not worse and worse and worse in Israeli medical education. Uh, I don't know, Tova, you teach medical students as well, quite a bit. Would you, do you feel that it's different now than, than when you were, were studying medicine, that the, the idea of, you know, what's good for the patient, what's good for the family is, yeah, is more. Yeah, more so, and it might be coming back that also families and parents and patients are far more informed and, and look things up and you have to be more prepared and they take a bigger part in decision-making than yeah, this, cited in the past. Yeah, the patronizing, the idea of patronizing and I know better and stuff like that, there's a democratization of medical knowledge uh, and I welcome it and we're taught to welcome it. Patients, I want, I want, I want my diabetic patient to know more about diabetes than I do, right? I want them to come in and say, you know what, if you, you know, there's this new uh, version of insulin. Is it good for me? I said, right. Well, you know, I, instead of being embarrassed and saying, ah, you know what you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. You know, I say, really, can you show this to me? Uh, let me learn about it. And let me, let's talk about it. You know, that attitude, that attitude um, is, which was anathema in the past. Well, I don't, how can that be? Uh, you know, is, is now perfect. Uh, and more acceptable. It's more acceptable. People are less threatened. Physicians are less threatened by the knowledge of their colleagues or their patients or the family members. Um, as long as it's not hostile, right? If you're coming because it's, not, it's just they remove hostility and then we're fine. Um, there are cultural aspects, you know, they're different in Israel, of course, and like every country, but other different cultural views of what. Let's say I'll take one example. You know, I have to ask my rabbi uh, if I should take this pill, uh, that type of thing, right? That's a certain cultural thing. Um, a wise rabbi will say, look, I'm a rabbi. You should do, you know, find, get a good doctor and make sure. Uh, and there can be in different, different cultures, you know, in different communities, depending where people came from. Some communities are still extremely patron patronizing, patriarchal and say, you know, the doctor's right. The teacher is right. Uh, everything, you know, you cannot question authority. Um, and then others are, you must always question authority, uh, you know. So, so I see the entire spectrum. And I think good medical educators uh, make sure the students can handle that entire spectrum without, you know, getting angry, without getting hostile and by, and doing what's ultimately best for the pay. Ultimately, we're here to serve the best interest of the patient. Um, I think, I don't, you know, but I think medical education worldwide is, is changing very, very much use of artificial intelligence. And, uh, yeah, right. Right. That's good. And so I just, a couple of more, uh, questions and then I'll, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, and then we can schedule others for your other kids and other subjects. Um, so, uh, you mentioned a shortage of uh, Tekken. Right? I heard that word, or, if, or, or you didn't say it, but a position. Now, we're, are you referring to um, uh, academic research positions or uh, uh, practitioner positions? No, there's a huge shortage, which, um, you know, in, in my view, like is a high priority for the Treasury and the Ministry of Health. And that is 
it begins. We're going to graduate all these physicians. You know, they're going to, you know, over the next 10 years, a number of annual graduates will more than double. They have to specialize. There have to be residency training positions, and then there have to be, there's plenty of need in the community, right? There's the, the, all these physicians will be needed by patients, but are there positions to train them uh -huh. into becoming family medicine specialists? Because in, in Israel, you know, family medicine is a very serious specialty. It's a four-year specialty. It's not, it's more than Toronto is a two-year, Canada is a two-year, you know, or there's general practice. You get to kind of just float or, you know, get a license and then do what you want. You, can, you know, you have family medicine is a specialty, internal medicine is a specialty, but there aren't enough slots for graduates to do to these specialties. There, let's say some, some of the, some of the less popular specialties any, you, can, you can get into, but specialties such as pediatrics, which is very popular, right? You reject applicants to pediatrics yeah. every yeah. year. Yeah. Good people, uh, yeah. gra Israeli graduates, one, and they have to wait. And, and in the meantime, they float around. So when I say there's a shortage, there's a shortage of those uh, mostly training positions towards, towards, and there isn't a good mapping. No one has taken the, I've talked to the, you know, I'm very close to the decision makers at the level of, management, not at the political level, uh, in the Ministry of Health. And they were the first to admit, no one has done the work of mapping needs by specialty nationwide in, wow. in different parts of the country. Wow. Uh, no, there's no shortage of every specialty in downtown Tel Aviv. In downtown Tel Aviv, near Ramad Achayal and Rehov Barzel, um, you know, near... You, there, there is a specialist for the right retina, there's a specialist for the left retina, for the left toe, for the right toe. There's 5.5 physicians per thousand people. In the Galil, there's 1.9 or 2.1 physicians per thousand people. You know, the, the OECD number is 3.2. So there's a discrepancy across the country in terms of health, and this is true of nurses too, of health professional man, human resource, and, and especially specialty-based. Uh, that is driven by money, by the way. There, okay. there's a money issue because, you know, the ability to make lots of money in private practice in Israel, in downtown Tel Aviv, is much greater than it is in Tiveria. Yeah. What are the specialties that uh, there's plenty of spaces for to do residencies? Rehabilitation medicine, physical medicine, pathology, uh, genetics, uh, I don't know why, just the most interesting, uh, where, where, where are there open in some parts of the country, family medicine is wide open in other parts it's closed, um, specialty, specialty. which specialties are also wide open for training and positions there, there, there is a, li I have a list of them. Neonatology. Yeah. Neonatology. You can get into, um, some of the more demanding ones, intensive care. I'm not sure. Not sure. I, uh, there, you could, you could look at the number of applicants, the ones that are highly competitive or ophthalmology, orthopedics, ear, nose and throat, you know, the usual dermatology, dermatology you know, uh, radiology, um, et cetera. So, uh, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Uh, Anyways, uh, okay, so I'm going to, um, maybe just one last question. I, I'm a big fan of uh, um, nutritional medicine um, and um, kind of the classic thing that uh, all the doctors who are into that in America say, oh, we didn't get any training in, uh, in nutrition. And, and that's actually, you know, like, you know, and there's a, this, incredible epidemic in America. And I guess there's, it's a growing uh, thing here of obesity and diabetes. And, um, and so the question is, is there a big, uh, is there a push for that? Um, I, yeah. Or, and is it enough or, um, there's a push, but it's not happening enough. And, uh, diabetes 
is a is a challenge, but it's also different in different parts of the community. It's it's very prominent in the Arab speaking community of the Galilee and and then and part of the Negev. Wow. Um, and that has both genetic and cultural uh, components. It is also true in other communities, but perhaps a little less so, where there's more mindedness to health, exercise, fitness, lifestyle medicine, so-called. There's a, there's a branch of the Israel Medical Association called Lifestyle Medicine, which has a huge nutritional component. Uh, and I would say one of the things we tried to do, uh, did actually, at the Faculty of Medicine in Sfat is develop this program called the Galilee Diabetes Sphere. We got a $20 million donation from the Russell Berry Foundation in New Jersey, uh, um, matched, and it's a $75 million program to change the lifestyle of the 1.8 million residents of the Galilee, half of whom are Arab speaking, uh, so that they are at less risk of obesity, diabetes, and its complications. That's a big part of what we're doing. And that needs to be broadened and changed. And so there's mindedness and it's starting to happen. M what's my fear? I have a slight fear. My fear is there are such good drugs now to like Ozempic and others that people are going to just say, you know what? We'll take a quick fix. I'll take a forget this exercising and nutrition stuff. I'm going to keep eating chocolate and watching TV and just shoot myself up with these drugs. They're, the doctors are really smart. The research is really smart. I can take these drugs that make me uh, urinate out glucose and I can take this Ozempic stuff and I'll be fine and I can still have my couch potato crappy lifestyle and eat and eat potato chips. Um, and Sign me up. Sign me up. So that's, so, so lifestyle medicine, and uh, we're, we are very fortunate. We have the head of lifestyle medicine at, at the Israeli Faculty of Medicine, Dr. Lilach Maletsky. She was a, some kind of general in the army also. And, um, and she's really pushing hard to change to healthy, healthy lifestyles. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, like uh, Basil said, Basil says, uh, I never know how to pronounce his name. He says, uh, yeah, you just, uh, sprinkle, yeah, you just sprinkle statins on your uh, ice cream and your steaks, you know. <laughs> I know. He's, in, he's heavily involved in clinical trials, of course. You, did he take it? Basil Lewis, Cardio head of cardiology at Carmel for a while. So, yes. Yeah, yes, he did. Anyway. So, and, and then the last thing you mentioned, Arab, uh, and we noticed, um, we went to uh, Hadassah to neurology and neurosurgery. And uh, I think he's maybe the head of neurology there. Or, and he's also some upcoming neurosurgeons are, are Arabs. You go to Hadassah and a lot of them, you know, and went to Shai Sedek and the head of the emergency room was Arab. So I just want to say that uh, and ask uh, that, say that a lot of this uh, medical students seem I don't know if there's affirmative action, like they're accelerated. This is affirmative action. There isn't affirmative yeah. action. Wasn't. No, there's never been affirmative action. Uh, it's a, you know, it couldn't happen in Israel. Uh, maybe there should be, but it couldn't, especially in the Galilee. Our, our faculty has a very low number of Arab students, surprisingly, even though it's the Galilee. Uh, and, and that has to do with the, you know, I don't want to get into judicial reform because it's a hard gag, right? But can you just think of this. if you favor a particular uh, zip code or cultural background or gender even or anything, the kid who didn't get in will take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And um, the medical schools and mission committees, and I've been very involved with them, are petrified uh, about that, right? And they will not enable affirmative action. Now, does it happen surreptitiously in the selection committees because people have certain mindsets and want to, you know, fix past deviations? Maybe, but officially, there's no, there's, it can't, there is affirmative action. Um, you're raising a point as to whether 
the number of Arab speaking um, medical professionals uh, is in medicine, nursing, pharmacy is proportion to the population or disproportion to the population. Certainly in pharmacy and in nursing is disproportionate. In, in medicine, I'm not sure, but I think it's becoming disproportionate. I think, yeah. I think it's, it's becoming. It's the cancer uh, medical school also. And it's, Depends, yeah. You know, areas in the country that have larger populations. But it will, it will change. You know, remember, high tech sucked a lot of smart it, Jewish Israelis away from medicine. If that bubble bursts a little bit, they'll go back to medicine. And that's part of the picture. It's a complicated picture. Yeah, yeah. I, I look where... Yeah, so, okay. Good. Well, um, I really thank you uh, tremendously. It's very uh, enlightening in, in, at many different levels and many different ways. So, um, so let's continue this. Thank you for your interest in us and uh, good luck in this project. And uh, let's hope that we get a lot of uh, Jews moving to Israel.